Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the public meeting for the Moose and Owl Fires. Today is Monday, September 19th, and we are coming at you from the Fish and Game Office here in Salmon, Idaho. A couple statistics to start out for this evening. We are reporting the Owl Fire at 747 acres and 53% containment. And the Moose Fire is 130,000 acres and 130,093 acres and 51% containment. And while our acres are burned, the acres burned here on the fire are definitely slowing down, the work around the fire is not. And part of what we're going to do tonight is tell you a little bit about the progress that we're having, some of the work with our operations, um, the evacuation areas that have been downgraded. The forest managers are here that will be able to answer some questions, and then ultimately you'll hear from our incident commander, Evans Quo. So we will take questions here in the room and on YouTube and Facebook towards the end, and I'll get up at the end and explain that process. Go ahead, though, and drop your questions in the chat at any time if you are joining us online. And with that, I will go ahead and introduce our Planning Operations Section Chief, Matt Call. Good evening, uh, Matt Call, Planning Operations. I don't know which hand to use for which. Uh, I got a chance to drive some of the parts of the fire today I hadn't seen before, and while it burned really hot in a lot of areas, especially where it got up and just really moved across there, some areas I had to look at my map to actually know that that was burned. So it's a real, a real mosaic burn, and uh, it's pretty interesting that this whole perimeter looks like a big black spot, but, but it really actually isn't. So I, I found, I, I always am intrigued by that. So we're gonna do a lap around the fire on this map, and there's not a lot of detail on here, but it'll give you kind of a big overview of what's, what's happening and what our folks are doing on the ground. And then we'll look at the cool map, the, uh, the 3D map. So starting up here in Panther Creek, uh, this is, this, all this black indicates not hold. Okay. okay. Is that better? Okay, sorry. Okay, <laughs> I'm kind of a rookie with the microphone. This black is all contained edge, really cold, and that's in a patrol status. Uh, and all we're doing there is just removing equipment, uh, pumps, hose, things like that. We'll get to the owl fire in just one sec. All this black edge all across here is in that same status. We do have a little bit of a, uh, I think we have a loader up here for this. While the rains were coming, we had rocks and things rolling down the road, and we had crews staged here to work on the owl fire. We wanted to make sure they could access in and out, as well as we could get into them with uh, medical assistance if needed. The owl fire, we flew again yesterday with uh, IR, very few, very, very, very little heat on it, and so we were able to put a lot of black line around it. We felt comfortable enough today to not even send anybody buddy up there. So the pictures and the IR we got from the drone showed just a few smokes interior from just small little logs. So that will be contained really soon. Hasn't grown at all. It's sitting, I think, at 747 acres, I think. So we're real comfortable not putting any, anybody up there because it's, it's about a four-mile hike just to get to the edge of the fire, and that's when the work starts. So our division soup went up there, double-checked it, and uh, we're going to let that sit for another day and then do another IR tomorrow. So then moving down here into Division Mike, we've got crews and logging equipment working on and rehabbing what we called the, the diamond lines. We have dozer lines and hand lines. And the detail on this is really difficult to see, but there's, there's lines kind of going all over the place, both on the edge of where the fire is now and the edge where we kind of wanted to keep the fire. And when it came through, it ran over. So we have a lot of that data captured in some of our databases. And we have crews out there. Basically, what they're doing is refurbing those lines, pulling logs across the dozer lines, and making sure that erosion doesn't damage that uh, or create longer-term problems. And that process is going to continue for probably a few weeks from here. So a lot of that repair work is, is in here and then all through this loop. I got a chance to drive uh, through those houses right there today, and that all looked really good. And then this edge here, I didn't see any heat, and we don't have much heat on our IR, so we don't have any people working on that. We're just flying with IR and, and uh, checking it out. Along this edge, just here in Mike, uh, I believe this is Wallace Creek, 
Stormy Peak Road is right there. So north of Stormy Peak, we've been able to actually work crews on the edge of that, kind of hike them in and kind of put in some check line, which is just kind of short pieces of line without an anchor point on each end. But that slows the fire progress. And we don't, when we don't have real fast fire progress, that's kind of all we need to slow it down and, and stop it. South of Stormy Peak, the terrain and the fuels get a little bit different, a little bit more hazardous. So we haven't been able to put crews in there, but we're flying it. We have a little bit of heat we'll show you on the IR, but it's really not growing too much. So not much heat north of Stormy Peak and a little bit south of it. The, and there's the power line right there. So we do have some uh, power line corridor cleanup planned in the next few days. We took down a, a whole bunch of trees in this area right here a few weeks ago in preparation to create a, somewhat of a contingency line if the fire should move south. All that timber's on the ground, we want to get it out, uh, out from under there so it's useful for something, but we need to shut the power lines down to get the equipment under there. So we're giving the power company time to notify their customers and kind of get ready for that, but we're putting a, equipment in place so that we can do that process. Where the fire here is in the watershed, uh, we've been able to hike down here in Turn Turner Gulch, and I'll show you what the heat looks like. Not a bunch, but we have been able to hike this point and work that again with that check line that I talked about and stop that southern progression. But at the top of Jesse Creek, there's still some heat, but it's, it's just not a good spot to put people. It's really dense, really thick, a lot of dead trees, a lot of dead standing trees, and we're just gonna monitor that growth. So today we flew it with the drone and kind of checked the heat out and it was putting up a little bit of smoke. I got that backwards. It was putting up smoke, so we decided to, to get one of the Type 1 helicopters up and, and fly it. Before we did that, we decided, to, let's, let's check it out with the drone. It's a small machine, it just takes a minute. We put that thing in the air and flew it, and it, it really wasn't much of a concern, so we were able to stand down the Type 1 helicopter and just, just monitor it from air. So we put you know, less hazard with the, with the pilot and less wear and tear and less cost on the helicopter. So that drone's really, uh, you making its money over there. Uh, this edge, we've been able to move a crew up in a little bit, and this is, I, I believe, Napius Creek area going up through here, and then I think Jackass Ridge over here. So because this terrain is similar to how it is over here, rough terrain, dense fuels, and the fire's not moving, we're not putting in any direct line over here. We have been able to have a few crews kind of push into the interior and put some check line in and slow it down, but there's not a lot of heat and not a lot of potential for growth uh, based on what we've seen. So no plans here to put any, any containment, continuous containment line in there. Around the uh, Bear Track Mine and Leesbury area, that looked really good and really cold, and we're beginning cleanup operations and rehab. We're leaving a lot of the hose, uh, the hose lays and those uh, pump and sprinkler systems in place. They're covering the structures, the older cabins, uh, as well as log decks, things like that. We're leaving those in place uh, we'll let the next team kind of decide when the appropriate time is to, to remove those. Uh, but those all look really, really good all, all throughout here. The Ridgeline Road, uh, we took some uh, heavy equipment along there and did some snagging, took out hazard trees. And then those only have a, a certain amount of reach into the forest that they can go. So we're taking a crew along there today, and they're, they're going a little bit deeper. What that, that is doing is if the fire should be in the watershed and start to move to the west, those trees, those dead trees, have, would, would burn, and then they would fall over across the line and then cause a fire hazard into this area. So it's, it's one of the methods we do to, to prep a line, and so we're doing that with that crew. We're really comfortable. I don't feel like this is, is going to move down here, but we're still in that, that just-in-case phase. So that's happening along there, as well as just continued road maintenance all throughout the, the entire fire. We've done a little bit of restructuring, and we're kind of moving a lot of our our equipment and people into uh, a repair and re kind of reconstruction group, but we're still maintaining uh, a, a heavy suppression presence as well. We have a lot of pumps. Well, we pulled all the pumps out, but left all the hose in place in the structures throughout here, and kind of the same up in Leesburg. Uh, we want to make sure the pumps are secure and aren't, don't freeze overnight, so we've kind of put those in a logistics cache that we have here, but we can plug those in at any moment. We have uh, lat long GPS points, we can put them in, just plug them into the systems pretty quickly. If things should change here in a drastic way and all those sprinkler systems can be reactivated pretty quickly with whoever is here on the fire. We have all those kind of saved in a database. So it's kind of a, a plug and play sort of thing. So with that, I think we'll move over to the, the, cool, the cool picture, my favorite picture. 
Not that. You want that? All right. Is this mic okay? Do I have to lean in? So we'll start here with the owl fire, and we'll kind of zoom in there. The way this works is is the red it, the edge is the that perimeter of the fire, but the black is what we're calling and considering contained. That hasn't changed size or shape at all in the last four days. So that's the owl fire, and when we look over at this fire, we can kind of see what the actual uh, active heat edge looks like. So all of this, all of these spots are are the uncontained edge. So we have a little bit of active heat along this edge, and this has all been contained here. But this is Jesse Creek here by the power line. I'm going to rotate this just so you get a good view of what this looks like. So kind of scooch down here. Lots, so it's a north-facing slope, so you have a lot of heavy timber and pretty steep. And those of you that have been up there, it's, it's, it's real dense. So putting crews down there for the gain is just not worth uh, what we would gain at this point, because we're not getting any growth, really. For a fire this size, we're, we're getting you know, less than 10 acres a day, which is, is pretty remarkable. And then all of this edge, there's not a lot of heat. There's a couple of spots here. But for the most part, this edge isn't showing a, a ton of heat north of Stormy Peak Road here. All of these have been contained, and then this will be black around the edge. Tomorrow we've got crews working on that. And we'll rotate here and go up into... That's not Stormy Peak. That's not Stormy Peak Road? Oh, up here. You're right. So all, all of this is black. us over here. So this is the area, the other area of uncontained line that we're not going to put any direct line on. So you see the, the power line. You can see those continuous fuels and kind of how rough this terrain is. And while it's, as the bird flies, about five miles, it's probably about 12 miles of line and, and isn't practical to go and, and put hand line in at this point in the ball game when we haven't had any, any growth or progression. And this is the Leesburg and the Bear Track mine area. Right there. And all that edge is just nice and cold, and we feel really good about that. So probably the bulk of our, our man hours right now are doing suppression and monitoring right now. We still have some people out doing active suppression, but that has gone down quite a bit. And with that, I think we'll go to our next presenter. Good evening, everyone. Incident meteorologist Jacqueline Anderson. Before I go into some of the weather we've experienced and also looking forward what we're looking at, I do want to talk a little bit about my role and responsibility here on the fire. First and foremost, I'm here for safety. Weather can have a huge impact out there and in the community. And so I'm here for safety to help provide the firefighters and the whole team with expectations for what the weather's going to do for today, tomorrow, and then also, we provide kind of an outlook looking forward so that we can see and communicate what's coming, what's coming up. What are the trends? Are we warming, drying? Are we getting into a wetter period? So I'm here to help support the incident management team, but then also definitely here for the safety aspect of things. Now we we're kind of into a, a drier spell here, and I'll talk about the matrix here a little bit and kind of give you a little bit of intel as to what the colors mean. But we're, you know, I think since last week, Tuesday, we've had a few rounds of, of active precipitation, showers and thunderstorms each day, even lingering into the night sometimes. And the fire has picked up around a quarter to about a half an inch, kind of a widespread, you know, what we're looking at across there for the last week or so. 
And a couple spots have picked up a little bit more, just kind of depends on, on where you're at across the fire, but some good beneficial moisture that we saw over the last week. Now this is the weather matrix, and I'll talk a little bit about this and what the weather looks like going forward. Now you'll see it's color coded on here. And so what that means is the red colors are, as a meteorologist, those are the bad days for me. Those are when I'm concerned that the weather's gonna have a big impact on the fire, on the firefighters out there. And once we get down into these yellow colors, that's more of a caution, a caution uh, category there. So, and then once we get down into the green colors, that's when the weather concerns really start to go down. And so we, we can see here that, you know, today we had a little bit more yellow on the matrix because we've been a little bit warmer. We're coming out of that wetter, cooler period, and so we're in a little brief warming and drying trend. And so some of the relative humidities out there fell to about 20, 23 to 30% to today, so definitely drier than what we've seen the last week or so. Now I do anticipate going forward through tomorrow, we're gonna have kind of a backdoor cold front bump up against our area. And so what that's gonna do is it's not gonna entirely move through here, it's not gonna cool things off initially. So I do anticipate tomorrow to be a little bit warmer, a little bit drier, anticipate the winds to kind of come around from the south, maybe over to the north or northeast tomorrow. And then again, you know, you can see here, this is the wind gust category. It does look like we're gonna be in for a little bit of a, a windier, breezy stretch as we go into the week. Now, my attention is really focused also on this Wednesday evening through Thursday time period. So you'll see I have a lot more green showing up here. So we have a system that's currently working through California. It's gonna eventually lift up through the Northern Rockies. And it looks like it's gonna bring another round of really beneficial rain. And with that, it looks like a pretty good potential for at least a 10th to a quarter of an inch. Maybe a little bit more, just kinda of depends on the exact track of the system. But again, this Wednesday through Thursday time period looks like we'll have a better potential for precipitation making it up here. And then if we look out ahead, after we get that beneficial moisture up here, a little bit, definitely a lot cooler on, on Thursday, then after that we do start to warm up and dry out as we head into the weekend and into the following week. So just to kind of recap, we're kind of warming and drying for the next day. We get some beneficial moisture in here towards the middle part of the week, and then we start to go back and towards a, into a warming and drying trend this weekend and into next week. Thanks. There we go, thank you, Jackie. Yep, so hi, my name is John Kern, fire behavior analyst. Uh, so what I do is uh, take that uh, weather information and look at the topography and the fuels out there and make some predictions and estimates and talk to the operations folks about what our fire is doing and what it uh, will be doing in the future and what steps we can do to, to help control that. So I wanted to start it out with a couple of photos here just from this afternoon. So we did pick up, you know, kind of a drier day uh, this morning, certainly more sunshine out there. We didn't have the showers that we've been experiencing almost daily on different parts of the fire there. Uh, so we did start to see our fire uh, starting to pick up. You can see it up in the ridges there into the higher uh, elevations and the taller trees there. We can go on to the next slide. Just This is from outside the uh, Shopco, our incident management, uh, incident command post rather, and we can see again just some of that heat coming off there. We hadn't seen that much the past couple of days, so we gave it a good day of drying today, and then we see, uh, so that's what the smoke looks like from a distance. Up close, it is smoldering through the needles and the dead and down materials there. Not a lot of flame with it yesterday and the day before, and it does creep around out there, moving around uh, inside our burn. Um, and like Matt was saying there, it looks like it's got a hard red line or a black line on our maps, but actually it's, you know, it's got lots of fingers and other areas out there, but nothing too scary. It does, in fact, burn down deep. Go ahead to our, our next one there. This is what a stump looks like once it catches fire out there and your deep, um, the thousand hour fuels, the very heavy fuels are so dry that there used to be a stump in the middle here and then it takes out each of the main trunks of that tree that we're holding it up before. This is an old stump that's been there probably, you know, 50 to 100 years and it just goes into the ground and actually burns underground down those uh, channels that the, uh, that the roots were making. So just showing you just how dry it is out there in places. Go ahead. And this is really one of the challenges for our uh, on the ground 
firefighters there when you mix all the rocks and the large trees and there was really dry fuels there to tell them to go in there with a uh, pickaxe and try to put a line in around that. That's really tough to do. They have to fall back and go around it. So they'll do that. Uh, so what did uh, Jackie have for us for the weather there? The things that I heard, uh, similar to today, we'll be looking at tomorrow, which is uh, only a 5% chance of rain. Relative humidity is lower than they've been, 18 to uh, 28 percent. We had been up around 25 to 35, if not higher than that in the past. So now we're down into some of the teens. Ridge top winds, 10 to 15 gusts, up to 30 for tomorrow, and then that carries on into Wednesday, staying a little bit breezy. But then Wednesday evening and into Thursday, we've got that rain. So it looks like we've got another day like today, where that fire activity was picking up. Nothing too scary, you know, just that smoldering out there, but. I wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow, with these conditions, we start to see maybe some of that surface movement of the fire through those needles into some of those lighter grasses, uh, creating more smoke up there. And it's even possible that we'll see a torching of one of the two, uh, one or two of the uh, spruce trees out there, or the dug firs that have those needles right to the ground. They could torch out. Uh, we don't expect to see a lot of problems with spotting because most of the fuels are dry, having seen that rain over the past few days. Um, so what did the uh, rain over the past few days do for us? This is one of our uh, graphs that I like here. It's a 1,000-hour fuel moisture, so there's really big, heavy fuels on the ground between 3 and 8 inches. And out here at the end, you can see it's been getting drier and drier. Down low with this graph means hotter and drier. And then we pick it up here with five days ago or six days ago, we got that rain. They start moving up, which means more moist, going towards that gray line, which is the average here. So that's what we wanted to see, so that's good for us. And then here's... Our energy release, that's the amount of heat and energy coming off of a square foot of the ground out there when it catches fire. Uh, and we can see here's the effect of that rain. Dropped us from near record conditions, 97th percentile down, to below the 70th percentile. And I'll mention a little something about that. So down below that, down to about average. But you can see just the last two days without rain, it's starting to pick back up just a little bit. And that's what we'll see the next couple of days, a little more activity out there. Um, here's one of those uh, energy release components, but it's got the forecast building in on it, showing that here's the effect of the rain. So the yellow is where we are today, picking up a little bit tomorrow without the rain, getting up higher, but then that Thursday rain comes and it really drops down, but then picks back up again with that warming, like uh, Jackie was saying there, tracking. So, But I do like the fact that it drops down low, below our average, and below that 70 that we saw before. Um, so the effects of the rain, what do we see from it? What have we seen in the past couple of weeks? This is out of one of the reports from the uh, Mustang fire from 10 years ago. That I uh, happen to be on out here, but uh, a lot of other people did as well. We're, we're just kind of pointing out here that if you get that quarter inch of rain, it's going to slow your fire behavior for one to three days. If you get between a quarter and a half, you buy yourself about three to five days of slowed fire behavior. And that's really what we've been seeing day after day, a little bit of rain out there. And if we can pick up two tenths, but over two days, get that duration out there, it'll buy us another three days of slow activity. Uh, so we're going to get through a couple of days of drying here with in slightly increased activity. But then that rain come Thursday will certainly buy us a couple of three, five days of slower activity. Um, so if we want to look further out, um, you know, what is the end of the year sort of thing? And I just wanted to point out, you know, as we move through our, our year, it's been a long fire season for you all and, and for many of us in the, the uh, business here. I started out in uh, May down on the uh, fires down in uh, New Mexico and then had uh, the summer solstice in Alaska where the sunset was at 2.30 in the morning. So I use that to say here that between August 3rd and September 15th, your days get shorter by over two hours. So from when this fire was really running its most to now, our days are two hours shorter. That's less time for the humidity to build up, the temperature to build up. Uh, it takes longer for that precipitation that we do get to dry off because the days are just that much shorter. And if we go out another, oh, Three weeks here out to October 15th, you lose yet another hour and a half of daylight. So our days are getting shorter. That sun angle is getting lower, 15 degrees in that first period, 12 degrees. So it's getting lower and lower, less effective at drying off our fuel. So, you know, we're going to get there. Uh, it may not be uh, today, tomorrow, or even next week or the week after, but we're getting there. Uh, the, the weather and the climate is in our favor, so we'll go ahead there. And there's just some more charts here saying that we've got a uh, – of about uh, today's uh, – Next, between now and uh, the 26th there, we've got between a 50% uh, chance and a 75% chance of a season-ending event coming, meaning lots and lots of rain that we just don't, the fire doesn't come back from. But if we go out to October 5th, in this set of models, and somebody once told me that uh, 
We talk about hurricane models and weather models that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we're going to look at this and say that it's useful. It might be wrong, but it's going to be useful. It's giving us trends. Don't uh, literally bet everything on it. So I look at this and say, well, 90% chance that the fire season is going to be over by the 5th of October. Well, that, that's good. You know, would I bet a dollar if nine times out of 10 I got my dollar back and another dollar? Yeah, I would do that. Would I bet my house on a 90% chance where 10% of the time I lose my home or if there's one bullet in out of, you know, one, uh, yeah, one bullet out of 10 in a chamber, would I pull that? No, I would not. So uh, it's all relative whether you're okay with that 90% chance of uh, something happening. So we're going to stay on it. And I'm sure Evans is going to pick up on that there. So we're looking good, hot and dry today. Tomorrow, we're going to see a little bit more smoke out there, a little bit more activity, maybe even some movement, possibly a tree or two torching out there. Um, but we've got plenty of crews looking at it. And the fuels are not the same fuels that we saw back at the beginning of the month. They've had rain on them. Um, we think we, you know, we're in a good place here, but don't be surprised if we see a little bit more activity. I think that was it, right? Yeah. So now we can uh, move on to our next speaker. Good evening, uh, Sheriff Penner. Um, We've had a few changes evacuation-wise. We made those today and that we put uh, Zone 11, 12, and 13 back into uh, ready from, from set. Zone 1 is still in, in set. I know Zone 1's been in set most of this fire, but they've had the misfortune of having fire coming from the north and then now it came from the west, so um, hopefully soon we can get that one back into green and hopefully just get them all off the map would be the most desirable. Um, and just, re just a reminder that you can get our maps and uh, information on uh, Lemhi County, Idaho.org. And that's a, a good place to look at the maps and get some current fire information. So. That's all I have. Good evening, Heather DeGeese, the Deputy Forest Supervisor here on the Salmon Chalice National Forest. Um, I've got a couple topics for you tonight. Uh, one of the things I've been hearing a lot about is access for hunting. And so with that in mind, we have shrunk the closure area on the north and west side of the fire. Um, so the fire was, uh, or the closure area was originally to the river, and we've shrunk it down to the ridge to the south of the river, and then shrunk it down some on the west side as well. So that map is available on the Salmon Chalice National Forest website. It'll be pushed out on social media, and we have some of the maps here um, in the room too, if, if folks wanna talk more about that after the meeting. Um, the second thing I've heard a lot about is firewood cutting. Um, so we've had this closure in place for um, quite a while this summer, and this is a big area where folks like to cut their firewood. So with that in mind, we have, um, We've been taking some tips from the public on some other areas that are maybe have some good firewood, but they're on roads that aren't currently open to the public. And so we've been out looking at some of those opportunities. And um, yet this week, we're planning to, um, outside the fire area, outside the closure, we're planning to um, open up some uh, roads that are not typically open for firewood cutting and get those opened up for the public to get some good firewood. Um, so stay, stay tuned, more to come on that, but we are looking for some areas close to town um, that we can offer up some more firewood opportunities. If you have an area that you know of that you'd like opened up, um, you can come into any of our offices, um, North Fork, Sam and Cobalt, or the uh, call, the Sam and Cobalt, or come into the the supervisor's office building, the blue building, the public lands building, and give us those suggestions. Circle on a map if you have an area that you'd like to see opened up, because that's what we're looking for. Um, also, in the fire area, um, we have to build our lines, our, our holding lines. We have done some cutting in there, 
and we are looking at some of that to sell commercially, but we are also looking at opportunities in there to make some of that wood available to the public for firewood. Um, some of it is green, so it will have to cure, but um, there is some dead that we will look at too. So we are definitely going to try to do a mix of some commercial sales as well as some personal use firewood um, once we're able to get that area opened up. So those uh, two things have been on my mind. Um, as far as the hunting goes, as um, our activities slow down on the fire, we will definitely look to continue to shrink this closure. It's, that's the direction we're going. Um, so we'll have more and more getting opened up. Um, and we're looking for some other opportunities um, for firewood cutting outside of the area. Uh, with that, I would just like to announce um, we have a, a new acting ranger here on the Salmon Cobalt Ranger District, Bobby Filbert. Um, she's in the room here this evening for the folks that are here, and we will plan to get her introduced um, out on Facebook Live at one of our next meetings. Um, in the room, we also have uh, Nate Meyer, who's our timber manager, and Eric Platts, our fire manager. So we will all be available for questions after the meeting as well. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, good evening, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Evan Skull, I'm the incident commander for Great Basin Team One. So thank you all for joining us here in person today as well as um, online. So what I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about is some of the reasons why um, behind the, the, um, the tactics and the, the, the plan that uh, Matt talked about what we're doing and also spend a little bit of time talking about moving forward um, as we go into the fall to tie into it with uh, some of what John was talking about weather-wise. So in the, our normal practice of fighting fire is we, you know, we, we put a fire line around, around, up against the fire, either a hand line, dozer line, uh, to stop the forward spread. Once we stop the forward spread, then we start what we call mop up, um, which is essentially we start extinguishing all the heat. Two ways we can do it. Um, the preferred way is to run hose into the area. You, you, hopefully if there's a water source nearby, if not, then we try to bring the water in. You may have seen some of the large, um, we call them pumpkins because they look like pumpkins. They're four to 5,000 gallons, um, they're round and they hold, they, they hold water. And so that's our water source and we fill them up using the water tenders. So we use that as our water supply to get water to the fire, and then uh, the mop-up goes a lot, lot faster. Um, once we get the edge mopped up, then we start going interior. And we, we usually only go in about as far as we think necessary to stop the fire. So if there's a lot of heavy unburned concentrations of fuel or ragged edge, then we're gonna probably go in deeper. But if it's a fairly light fuel, clean burn, where the, most of the fuels were uh, consumed, we don't have to go in as deep. But the whole idea is to be able to stop the fire and hold that fire from any interior burning, torching, which ultimately ends up in being, <coughs> excuse me, spot fires. Um, so on this fire in particular, there's a lot of areas, like let's just take a look at um, the diamond line back in, uh, back in August when we were first here. I'd like to speak about that because we were here when, when all that happened. Um, so the diamond line was burned out over the course of about four or five nights, and then um, probably over the course of the next 10 days that we were here, the crews worked that line, mopped it up. We brought the water in from the top uh, with the tenders uh, because there weren't any, any water sources up there naturally. So we mopped that up fairly extensively uh, for a, a great deal of time. And then once we uh, felt comfortable with it, that it was not gonna escape on us, we, we made the perimeter black. And so that was a lot of what went on in there. Now I want to talk a little bit about the, the fire's edge along here. As you've been hearing us talk about, oh, probably for most of the time that we've been here, ever since we did our initial assessment, that particular edge is not a clean edge. It's very ragged. In fact, if you look at my hand, that's kind of what it looks like. And if you, you look at the, the total amount of perimeter, it's very fingery. Um, if the fire edge looked like that, it's significantly less perimeter and it's significantly easier and faster to get around, which means we can do more of it. So it's not that the firefighters are worried about hard work. It is a hard job, but if the fire edge looks like that and it's a fairly clean edge, then it's a lot faster, which means we can do way more of it. When it's like that, we have to follow all the individual little fingers up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, in addition to that, that is on this fire, one of the heaviest concentrations of snags, dead trees that we have out there is in the watershed as well as Bob Moore Fen and Fenster Creek. The snags represent a big hazard to us. Um, the rain had an added benefit of um, toning down the fire behavior, allow us to get close, 
but unfortunately it did not mitigate the hazards of the snags. The snags are, st the snags are still standing. And then when we start getting some of those wind gusts associated with the thunderstorms, do you guys remember three nights ago, three days ago afternoon, we got that sun, that cell blew through. Um, it's about 35 mile an hour winds. Um, the porta potties over at our Shopco building, some of them were teetering, which that's kind of a <laughs> yeah, that's a hazard unto itself. But uh, when we get those winds, especially in the, the 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 snags, that's when the trees start coming down. And so we had to pull people out. It's, it's just not very safe to work in there, not safe at all. Um, so these particular areas present a lot more challenge to us, not only the steepness of slope, but also the heavy concentration of fuels and then the snags that are standing. Um, it makes it difficult for us to expect firefighters to go in there and work that piece of line for five, six days at a time, and mostly they're bent over, they're bent, bent over doing this routine, not be able to see the snags around them. Um, so. Other places where we, where we have to, we can cut the snags down, but it, in a lot of the, the snag concentration in this area is about 40 to 50%, meaning for every 10 trees, probably four to five of them are prone to maybe coming down. And sometimes they, they don't make a lot of noise when they come down, in which case you have no warning. So, and we have lost firefighters this year, in fact, from snags. Um, not on this fire, but that was in Oregon earlier in the year. So that's been one of our big, big challenges there. Um, so the tactic that we are employing, as Matt described, it's, it's more hot spotting. And by hot spotting, we mean we go in, we identify where it's hot, and we put a little bit of line in certain areas, just enough to break it up the continuity from the unburned fuels, or we try to take advantage of the rain. Open it up, turn over the burning logs, expose the, the stump holes, and let Mother Nature take, it, take its course. Um, because why not? Why wouldn't you? Um, so that's been fairly effective, but the downside to hot spotting is it's not continuous line. It's not continuous line like it was on the diamond line that went from the, all the way down at the bottom all the way up to the very top. Um, Matt m mentioned a couple times it's not anchored. And what we mean by anchored is um, where we start and stop, it's not necessarily tied into something that'll keep it from button hooking around. So if we anchor off a road, we also plan to use the road to keep it from sneaking around and, and backdooring us. So when we hotspot along, imagine if we were to take a magic marker and make a bunch of dashes all along that red edge. Where, wherever the crews are working, we make a little black dash mark. But it's not continuous, unlike it is on the Diamond Line, unlike it is on the 300 Road west of Leesburg, unlike right off the Panther Creek Road. So what I'm, what I guess what I'm trying to tell you folks is we're taking advantage of the weather. We're trying to get the crews in there. They're doing a lot of good work. Um, but there is just not a continuous line, which means the risk of escape, there is risk of escape. Under the current weather conditions we have, I would characterize the risk as being fairly low, but if things were to dry out and we were to resume having hot, dry, warm weather, like say last week of September, first week of October, the risk then goes up. It never really goes away, not until there's snow on that hillside, okay? Um, is it manageable? We believe so because we've also got that contingency line at the toe of the slope, and we also looked at a lot of the uh, grassy um, hillside down below the timber, and there's a lot of areas where the grass is pretty sparse. So we're, we're thinking that if the fire does start burning actively again in the timber because it dries out and warms up, um, it's not gonna go very far, and it's a lot easier for us to pick up the fire in the grass. So as opposed to committing resources, firefighters, to fairly hazardous locations, we have other options. And those other options are, well, frankly, they're a lot safer um, and probably maybe more effective too. So we're always looking for that as well. So that's, that's kind of what we're, we're, we're the situation that we're in. Um, so we, there is going to be uncontained fire on that hillside right above town. There's going to be uncontained fire north of the power line uh, up in Sharkey Creek. Uh, where we can, we're trying to take the heat out of it, the, the, the main steam, but it's not completely 100% tied in, which is why we cannot give you any guarantees or any odds, other than to say that right now under the weather conditions we have, um, we feel like the, the, the probability is low, but it's not zero. There is no zero probability. So as the season continues to progress and we see how the, the fall shapes up, uh, I mean, you folks live here, you know some years you start getting that cold, dry, you know, the cold, wet, even some snow in the high country about this time of year. Than other years, you know that you, it's summer-like conditions all the way into October, uh, you know, well into October. 
So not, not trying to try to predict what the, fu what the future holds. We are looking at the past because that is a good indication of what the future may hold, but like John said, we're not willing to gamble. So we've, put, we've got plans in place for either scenario. If the fire then never, never moves up there, great. We've got plenty of fire suppression repair to repair all the, the, the dozer lines and hand lines we put in so we don't have erosion problems. But if the fire does wake up and start moving down because the weather changes, we have those same people that can just shift gears and take action to uh, work on the fire and go back into suppression mode. We're also looking at um, the, second, the last week of September and the first week of October because um, my team, Great Basin Team 1, our last work day is uh, this Thursday, the 22nd. So uh, the order was placed this morning for a replacement incident management team, and they will be arriving late Wednesday into Thursday. We'll go through an orderly transition with them, get them up to speed, and then ultimately we'll, uh, we'll pass them the torch just like the previous team passed it to, passed it to us. It's kind of like a relay race, and um, unfortunately it's a long relay race, uh, but that's just, I think we talked about that in one of the earlier town meetings. It's kind of the nature of an indirect strategy on a fire. Um, so that team will be, uh, be with you for the last week of September into the first week of October, and then as they get towards the end of their tour of duty, um, we can again work with the forest and the BLM and the, and the IDL to assess what's the next organization that's needed or are we truly getting into the onset of a fall pattern. So our intention is not to leave you folks hanging. Um, our intention is to do as, as much as we can during the time we're here and then try to set the next team up for as much preparation, lay out the lines, the, here's our plan of attack if, if we were to still stay here and then get them up to speed as, so they can uh, continue the fight. So with that, I guess I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Mary unless, unless somebody actually has questions for me while I'm up here. Okay, well thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Evans. So now we've moved into the question and answer portion of the meeting. We can take the questions in the room and Patty will help by bringing you the microphone. Otherwise, we can take the questions that we have online. We do have one already for the forest, so we will start with that. But just raise your hand and Patty will move to you and I'll facilitate the ones here in the room. But to start with our first online question, the question is about the log decks and what is the plan for those and, and how they're gonna be available and to who. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, Nate Meyer, I'm the North Zone Timber Program Manager on the forest. We've got several different options we're looking at with the log decks. Um, they're, uh, probably a majority of them we are going to look at selling commercially through timber sale contracts. A lot of them are, are pretty large in size and um, it's just safer and more efficient to, to kick those out as, um, as commercial timber sales to industry. Um, they've got the equipment to handle it. We're talking a lot of these decks are you know, 10 to 15 feet tall at their highest point. Um, a lot of wood in there, uh, decks that size, they're pretty dangerous to be around if, you, if you're gonna start cutting in on them. So having, selling those to industry where they have log loaders, they have log processors, log trucks to move that out. Um, on the flip side, we do have quite a few smaller decks that, um, you know, three to four feet tall. Those are the ones that we're looking at. We'll probably release those out for, uh, for firewood gathering under with our uh, firewood permits. Those are a lot safer to work with. They're a little bit um, smaller in size. So again, it's just, those are probably a lot better for firewood gatherers because a logger probably doesn't want to mess with a bunch of these small little decks all over the road. Uh, additionally, I was up the 300 road today along Moose Creek, um, just north of the mine, where we did a contingency line up there. There's a bunch of creeks and stuff that cross that the road crosses. Um, we didn't put equipment in there. Instead, we, we utilized hand crews to create the, the contingency lines in those areas. Uh, those hand crews cut quite a few trees, but they, they bucked them up into smaller rounds uh, with 
as operations mentioned, we moved into more of a suppression repair mode in that area. We've got crews in there um, bringing a lot of those larger log, log rounds out to the road. So eventually when we open up the closure areas, there's going to be a fair amount of uh, stacked log rounds along the 300 road. And as we get closer to that, the forest will put out uh, maps and probably a press release on the exact locations of where the, the log decks are and then the log rounds are that would be available for uh, firewood. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, again, a combination of, of uh, timber sale contracts selling the decks and then uh, looking at some of the other areas for, for public firewood. Any more questions, um, you can find me after, or I'll be here. Will it be possible, excuse me. Will it be possible to green sheet a few saw logs off of, off of any of these smaller decks if they happen to be saw logs there? Can, can a person, will they be available to uh, somebody with a small sawmill? For instance, that, so yeah. When when I mean commercial sale, that's something else we're yeah. looking at. So we've got on the ground right now. We have a total of about forty decks. We're not going to put all of those forty decks under one contract. We're going to look at you know where they're at uh, in in terms of location on the ground. What makes sense to split them up? So that's uh, we'll likely do. Um, you know, in some areas, it might make sense for us to do a larger contract where we put multiple decks on a, on a larger scale contract. There might be an area where we put one deck that's maybe 20, 30 trees on a contract. We don't really have the green slips anymore on the Forest Service side, but we do have these smaller, smaller uh, deck contracts. So, again, just looking at options. We're not quite there yet, though, on, on how we're going to do it. <laughs> Anyone else? We're hunters and we have family coming from out of state to hunt. And I'm wondering how, is there any idea how soon, the not in the fire area, but the closed area south of the fire area, is there any idea when that area? It, we camp at Trapper Flat, and it's within the closed area. And is there any idea how soon that area will be available for the public to camp and hunt and that? There's a lot of variables. Well, and I understand that. <laughs> um, <laughs> when does the hunting season start, or when, do, when does that hunt start? Uh, on the 7th, on the 15th. I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, so remember how I was talking about those two options? One is the fire season kind of falls on its face because the onset of fall happens here in the next week or so. Yeah. And then the other option that it goes well into, well, you know, summer goes well into the fall. If, it, if it's the former, the first one, pretty decent odds, I'd say. But if it's the other one, yeah, that, like I said, there's, there's a lot of variables at play here. Well, there is no fire in the area that we hunt in. Understood. But is in that closed area. Understood. Yep. Okay. Now that's something that the uh, the next team will continue working with the mm -hmm. the, the, the forest as well as um, you know whoever's the jur land jurisdiction, be it BLM, IDL, mm -hmm. to to look at the hazards and make our best uh, best guess or b best calculations with regard to what what's the likelihood of fire going into that area. Um, and if it's not very high, then yeah, I think they can uh, they would be able to allow it. But if there's still a threat from the fire. Um, then most likely not. And while we don't have any more questions online, I'm looking around the room to see if any other hands are up. Looks like we've got another one. I'm going to be very blunt about this. I want to know why it's okay to log to prevent the fire or to stop the fires, but we have no logging industry, no grazing for sheep, cattle, whatever, to prevent the forest fires. I'm probably older than a lot of people in this room, and I recall many mills and stud mills in this area and over around Targhee Forest 
and they logged an area. And they had foresters that went in with them for prevention to do things correctly. And yet at this point, none of that is allowed anymore or doesn't seem to be allowed. And so I don't understand. It's like you're sending us a mixed message. It's okay to go in and log to stop the fire, but it's not okay to log and do all of these other things to prevent the fire. Thank you for that question. Um, so the fire area is an active allotment. Um, so we are, it's the Diamond Moose allotment. And uh, so it is in a active allotment, this area is. And as far as the timber sales side of it, um, Nate, Nate Meyer here that was just speaking with us about the plans for the decks, um, he's also been working with us on a project called the Stormy Project. Um, unfortunately, it burnt up. Um, we were getting close to releasing a final decision on that, and it, it did have um, a significant timber component in it. Um, in addition to that, we had the Feel and Sharky timber sale that's up on the Ridge Road. That timber sale has been under contract, um, sold for a couple years now. We're just waiting on the, the market and the mill that bought it to get in there and log it. So we are trying um, to work with the market and the industry that we still have here um, to get some timber sales out. Um, we do recognize it as a good tool to reduce the fuels. Um, so we are working on that. We've um, continued to try to package up, like Nate was talking about, even the log decks. You know, package them in a way that if there's locals that want to purchase them, that they have that ability to. So we definitely see um, timber sales as a tool to deal with fuels reduction and um, have been trying to get some of those out on the market and we'll continue to have plans to continue to do that. Uh, we're already talking about options to salvage um, some of this material. So we definitely um, understand the value of using timber harvest um, as a tool. My, my question's for Matt. Uh, as far as what's going down to Owl Creek, you have crews sitting down there at Cove Creek. What is their responsibility down there the last two days? So we've got a hotshot crew and, a, and an engine crew at Cove Creek. And the last couple, so the last two days before today, they're, they're so up, up the Owl, and then they have a spike camp at Spring Creek. They're responsible. Oh, thanks. So they were going to hike up here and put as much line as, as made sense. But it, we've had continuous rain there for the last couple of days. And then after flying it yesterday, and it's showing no heat, it didn't make sense to put them up there. So today, so what, what do we do with them when they can't hike up there and they can't do anything? They basically just, just have to kind of sit in place or we find some projects for them close by. But there was nothing they could do in this area. All the work had been done. So they, they basically just, just kind of sat put for the day. Today, we put them up Piney Creek and we have some hand line and some hose and some pumps that we're able to locate and they went up there, re, uh, pulled all that equipment out and we're able to start rehabbing some line. There are also some people there that are uh, part of the support staff. So there's some medics there and, and we want our medics to just sit there, <laughs> right? We don't want our medics busy. And then some base camp folks and some radio support people. So those people would probably be, be there as well. So while they're busy sitting there at Cove Creek, what's the chance of them mopping from Pine Creek to Panther Creek? All that's going to slide, all that fresh rain last night. I was down there. My trailer sits at Owl Creek. So I, very res I know what's going on down there and where they're going up. But from, from Pine Creek uh, Bridge clear to Panther Creek, all the logs that were cut and left there are all going to roll down, and that's all going to be a slide and a rock slide for those of us that go down and go steelhead fishing fall and spring. Yep, so what you're saying makes sense, and while I have not seen that piece of ground, what we try to do is put crews where, where it makes sense to make sure we secure the line, but we also got to make sure that, that we're not putting them in an adverse position so that, that they get hurt as well. We, we, we do take some risks, but we have to evaluate those risks that we take based on, you know, cost-benefit, right? So and I, I don't know exactly what that piece of line looks, and I'll have to, I'll have to ask that division soup, and if there is something there that, that can be done, we will do it, 
but there are some things that, that look like if, in places we should do that, that maybe it doesn't make sense for us to, to approach. So I can also just add to that concern about the, the roads out there. So um, we are working on securing funding because we know, we know in this country we're going to have debris flows, rock slides. We're going to have that issue. And so we're, we're working on securing the funding and figuring out a mechanism, a contract or an agreement, something to be able to clear those main roads um, over the winter or spring, fall, that type of thing when we do get those slides. Particularly concerned, you know, the Salmon River Road, um, that area. And uh, the forest does also have a road crew that um, we can, you know, they're often all over on the forest scattered, but we can mobilize them to this area if, if we are gonna get a bunch of moisture and are concerned. Um, so we definitely are um, planning ahead and anticipating getting some of those debris flows and, and mudslides and that type of thing. So that's on our radar for sure. And um, the county does help us out with uh, road work on the Salmon River Road in the winter. And we've been talking to them a little bit too and, and starting to try to get some plans in place. So. So, yeah, I think we still have some equipment in there. So if stuff rolls down on the road right now, we can get it out of there. Um, but also, if, if we can take a look at it and if it is safe for them to go in there and, and mitigate some of that concern, we can definitely take a look at it. But I think now they are reassigned, but I'll let Matt take that. Yeah, so one thing, we're going on nine, ten weeks, and there's a lot of stuff that has happened out here that that we may not have captured, and we're trying to track that as well as possible. So if if there's stuff out there that needs to be fixed that you know of, we might not. And so that's where we can rely on you. You guys can bring that to us, and we can capture that. We can put that in the database, and we can put those crews to work, and it might just be that we don't know about it. And, and I, I, to be honest, we might just not know that that's a problem that we need to fix. And if it is, and it's something that falls within our scope, then we'll absolutely get those folks to work and we'll fix that. Does that, does that help? So let, let's talk afterwards so you can, you can show us where it is and we can address it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mary. Okay, we've got time for one more question. I have one more question. However, it's complex and it's for Evans. Okay. We've been really lucky. First of all, you've left, this is your second time leaving and both times You've, you're leaving the fire in a really good situation. That's my opinion. We've been lucky with the rain. It slowed down the fire. It settled down. It's wet the, the short fused fuels, the one-hour fuels. You have 1,000-hour fuels up there that we're going to burn until it gets two feet of sn snow on top of it. We've heard tonight that there's a patchwork of forest up there that's not burned. It's all potential. We have, we're exposed to the southeastern edge of the fire is an existential threat to salmon in the area south. I understand the concerns about working in the snags, and I understand everything you've said about it being indirect versus going direct. But what I want to know is, if your meteorologist's presentation took a couple of nights ago about the regional warming and drying season that we're going into, potentially, there's no knowns, but potentially, if it dries out, warms up, the fire picks up, one or two of those snags, one or two of those logs rolls down along Napius Creek, runs across, well, it's already burned across Jesse, and it's into the next gulch in the top of it. If it burns around on the front side of the ridge, the east side of the ridge, comes around Baldy, it's got nothing to stop it all the way down to Williams Creek Road, and that's not a defensible space in my opinion. It'll run down uh, Perot Creek, on the other side, from Napius, there's nothing to stop it through all that nasty forest that you were describing, a very difficult fight. If it picks up and move, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. 
And I want to know why I should feel more comfortable now. I understand it's all odds, and nobody can predict it. But we've still got the threat, an existential threat to the town. I live south down by Shoup Bridge. That thing's aimed at me. Why shouldn't I leave town? But thank you, Evans. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. So my intent is not to try to make you folks feel better by telling you what you want to hear. My intent is to give it to you straight. And I think uh, in our time here, both now and as well as when we were here back in August, we gave it to you straight. We told you what our concerns were um, in back in August, and we're telling you what our concerns are now, that there's a chance that fire season could extend into October, despite the rains we've been having. And so to that, to that end, we have been putting contingency lines in, and we've been looking for that next place that we can cut this thing off. And to be honest, to be frank, perfectly frank, we have not found it. We have not found that diamond ridge that we used up there. We have not found it inside Chips or Pollard or any of the other drainages. You know where we found it? Williams Creek Road. So quite a bit of effort has gone on um, in the last two weeks that we've been here to not only prep the toe of the slope on the Forest Service boundary and also Williams Creek Road as the, the line in the sand that we would use to, in the event we did have fire come this way. Is there a possibility that I could make another nine mile run? Well, yeah, it, it did it already. Okay. However, nine mile run this way, when the drainage is in line with the wind, it acts as a funnel. Nine mile run coming out of Jesse Creek into Turner Creek, going up and over, up and over. Every time it, it goes over and down, it slows down a little bit. Okay. So it does not have the same alignment with the terrain that we had with Napius going up to the ridge that we do because it's got to go down Turner Creek, Turner Gulch, go up the other side, down into, now we're probably into Ch uh, Pollard, down, work its way down, then go back up. It'll probably run up the hill faster, down into, um, now, we're, now we're into Chips, right? And so on and so forth, up, down, up, down, up, down. That's a lot different mechanism than if it just had a straight shot. So, so to that end, do we think it's likely? Yeah, it's likely. Are there any zero, you know, 100% guarantees in this or 0% likelihood? No, but where is it? On the scale of high to really low, we're thinking it's trending more on the lower side, especially with the weather that we've been having. Um, you saw the, the charts that John put up, that if we get a half inch of rain, we're looking at about a three day time period for the fire to recover, for the fuels to dry out. Um, Will you have that condition? Well, you got to remember, days are getting shorter. Sun is at a lower angle. The likelihood of you guys getting 90 degree weather again is less. Uh, and if you do, it'll probably be for shorter hours. We're not talking about daylight. Sun comes up at 6 in the morning and is up until 9 o'clock in the evening anymore. Your days are a lot shorter, so your ability for this fire to recover from any of the rainstorms goes down. Yes, sir. You, uh, can you, could you get the microphone? I know, but there's people online that can't hear you. <laughs> the fire run seven to nine miles, that was because you had westerly winds. Correct. Came out of nowhere. Thunderstorm. Prevailing winds here are out of the northwest. If you get this side of Baldy, you're right, there's nothing that's going to stop it. And in fact, Perot Creek runs right along behind it. There are no defensible lines. And Williams Creek Road is a windy, nasty road. If, if I'm looking at the Ridge Road and Williams Creek and the amount of trimming you've done on either side. And then I go back and I look at the, the picture from Wallace Lake where it burned, jumped right over your fire break and just ravaged on. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to have faith in any of that. I mean, you've got, you've got 30 to 40% more force to burn there, potentially. It could all happen quickly because you don't have a place to stop it. Mm -hmm. So on, and, and the thousand-hour fuels are still burning up there, just like embers in a campfire from two days ago. So when we have 50 mile an hour winds, it's um, it's a force of nature. You can't get out in front of a fire that's under the influence of 50 mile an hour winds. Um, a while back, we were on another fire in another state, and we got introduced as the same people that fight hurricanes, and we kind of said, "Well, that's not really that accurate. You know, it's not accurate. You can't fight a hurricane." You can't fight a force of nature. What we do is after, you know, you get all the people out of the way, and then once the storm um, 
subsides, we come back in and try to help restore infrastructure, clear roads, get power back on, that type of thing. Um, when you have a fire that burns under those type of conditions that you had back on September 7th, yeah, there's nothing you can do other than get people out of its way. And that is the cooperation with Lemhi County Sheriff. That's all the evacuation planning. Um, and that plan is still in place. So that the, all the evacuation plan that we've done is still in place. The Lemhi County still has all the zones. So in the event, and I'm not saying there's a high likelihood, I'm not saying there's a zero likelihood, but in the event that fire conditions continue, summer comes back, in other words, that we have similar to what we had on September 7th, then it, it could be that we have to implement those same contingency plans. Right now, our, the focus is, is trying to keep it up on the up high, and that's the hot spotting actions the crews are taking. We've also looked at the grassy fuels down below it, thinking that's a really good place to catch the fire without all the risk. Um, so we do have ways of trying to slow it down, but you're right. If it continues to crawl around up on the ridge top in the heavy fuels where all the snags are, not gonna be a whole lot we can do about it because we can't get in there to cut it off. In which case, then that's why we have the additional plans of the, the indirect box that we've created. That's why we also have the plans with the sheriff to notify people that it might be time to leave or it might be time to get ready to leave. So we're dealing with a, a lot of, a lot of um, uncertainty, a lot of variables here, but we've tried to establish what the bookends are on the low end and what the bookends are on the high end. And so that way we don't get caught off guard. We don't get left in a situation where we haven't thought something out and come up with, well, what is our mitigation plan for that? So I, I think we're, are we running low, short on time? Okay. Good question, sir. And I'm sure if you're voicing them, then other people probably have them. So thank you for, for asking them. Thank you. We've got time for a safety question. Let's do one more safety question. Has anybody discovered, like Matt, uh, why when a safe zone information is turned into the district, Salmon Chalice District Supervisor's Office and to the incident commanders that are on duty at 8 o'clock in the evening, why that kind of information isn't passed on down to the operations man? Why would that not be passed on? Is it not relevant? Our, our concern is we're all familiar with the Yarnell fire. We were down there for 25 years. So if there's safe zone information presented, it seems like the operations manager would have, have it presented to him so that he could maybe base some decisions on that. So you might ask whoever the incident commander is, you might ask Matt about it. He might know why that what information wasn't passed on. So you're talking about something or an event that happened that I'm, I'm not familiar with, but let me, let me talk a little bit more about our, pra our firefighting practices. The talking about Napoleon Ridge and Bobcat Gulch. Wasn't here then yeah. when, when all that burned. That's, but that's the problem always. When people get familiar with the area, it's So safety zones and escape routes are something that each crew needs to establish before they engage in work. So if something bad happens, where am I going to go and how am I going to get there? That's the simplest way for me to put it. Um, given that we cannot control, micromanage, that's a bad word, right, in any organization, we don't micromanage the crews. We establish what our intention is, what the, their assignment, which side of the fire they're on, what objectives we want to achieve, i.e. keep the fire to the west side of the highway, west side of the river. And then after that, we let the crews, we give them quite a bit of autonomy to figure out, okay, what's the exact, the exact route I'm gonna take, the exact hillside I'm gonna go up, um, where's my safety zones, escape routes, and then they brief their, all their people. And so as far as information coming to, into us, as far as where a safety zone is, I'm having a, I, I'm not understanding um, how, how, how that, that kind of comes into play here because each one of the crews is responsible for finding their own safety zone and escape route before they even engage on the fire. Um, we are, f and we appreciate that, um, but again, like I said, I, you're talking about a context that I wasn't here uh, when it happened, um, but I am familiar with Yarnell Hill, sir. I'm also familiar with Man Gulch, Storm King Mountain, Strawberry Fire, Ferguson, um, many, many other fires. Um, Kramer, uh, um, 30 Mile. We try to make, um, 
make ourselves a learning organization where we take a look at accidents and fatalities that occur in the past and learn from what happened there, some of the key decisions that were made, and then apply that in our context, in our frame of mind, my situation. Would I do the same thing knowing what they knew at the time? I don't know, that's hindsight. But I, I, would, I try to take those lessons learned from the past, we all do, and apply it to how we, how we move forward um, when we fight fire. They were just wondering why it hadn't been passed on. Okay. And, and they made a big deal when I, I understood and, and it, they made a big deal about, boy, that's really important, that's really important. No, there is no plan to burn out Napoleon and Bobcat Hill. This is the incident commander, but that's really important information. So I understand it. I'm getting... I'm going to give you the same answer that I gave you when I started. Was I wasn't here when when that happened, so I can't. It, it's it's not it's not far. It's it's not hard. It's I can't talk about it because it, I wasn't here when it happened. I don't have the context. So. Is there anybody who can answer that? Why that wasn't passed on? Is there an incident commander here, representative? Is there the only one here that I really know is Matt, and he's the only one I dealt with that was dead honest, except for an old guy named Gill. He said he was in charge of BS. That's what his words. Here's Sometimes five had is a sense of humor. It's hard to say who is who is there when you talk to him, but we we'll get with you afterwards. Thanks, Ben. And with that, I am going to have to say we're going to close the meeting for tonight, but that does not mean that we won't be here to answer any additional questions. All of our experts will be here. There are maps around the tables and in the room. You can still continue to ask questions online and we will answer those. And then we will announce when we have another community meeting. Thank you for your attendance.